Lord, we just lift you up in this place. If we can just sing that, let us experience the glory of your goodness. Because that's my prayer this morning over each and every one of you. Yes, it's Mother's Day today and we're going to spend some time celebrating Mother's Day. But the main reason we are here is to celebrate the goodness of God, to celebrate the glory of God, because He is the one that looks after us. He's the one that takes care of us. And the whole theme of today is about taking care of, of you, taking care of mothers. But it is God that takes care of each and every one of us. And so my prayer this morning is as we sing this, that we would become a aware of his presence and experience the glory of his goodness because that's what he wants in our lives this morning he wants you to experience the glory of his goodness because when you're in that when you're in the presence of God when you're in that glory of his goodness then nothing else in the world matters nothing else matters so no matter what you're going through this morning my prayer is that you would stand here and experience the glory of God's goodness this morning so why don't we just sing that out and just invite him to just wash over us let his Holy Spirit wash over your life this morning and just invite him into your heart this morning and just experience this moment, this time with God. Let's sing that out, everyone. that you are good, that you are great, Lord, that you are our King of Kings, Lord. So, Lord, we just want to forget everything else that's going on around us this morning, Lord, and just experience that glory that is you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you are our ultimate care of God, that you take care of our lives, Lord, and that you care about every single person here, Lord. And you care about the big things that are going on in our life and the small things that are going on in our life this morning. Lord, nothing is too trivial for you, God. You know everything about us, every part of us, Lord, and you love us anyway, God. So we just thank you for that. And we give you the praise and we give you the glory this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we just take our seats this morning. Welcome. Feels a bit different this morning, doesn't it? We're all sitting around having some coffee. It is nice. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. I hope that you have been spoilt this morning. We're just going to get ready to give this morning. And I have this verse which ties in very well with our theme, which I'll talk about a bit later on. But it's just about um, the way God takes care of us. It says, um, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If, not, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then at the end, it just says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So it's just an encouragement that, you know, look at the flowers. Look at how beautiful and splendorous they are, and God takes care of them, and they do not have to sow and reap for their beauty. And so I just want to encourage you as we give this morning not to worry about tomorrow, not to worry about our finances, not to worry about what's going on, but just to trust in God and trust that God is going to take care of each and every one of us. So why don't we just pray over that as we give this morning. Lord, I just 
lift up this church to you. I lift up these finances to you, Lord. I just pray a blessing over every person here and I pray a blessing over each person that gives this morning, Lord. So I pray that you would use this money, Lord, for your glory and for your good in Jesus' name. Amen. run off now and turn our slow cooker on because the one job the one time he had to make dinner forgot it he he set it all up so he was prepared just didn't switch it on so well done babe see you in five minutes all right we've got a few announcements this morning do we have anyone visiting here for the first time Anyone visiting? Hands up if you're visiting here for the first time. I don't see any hands. So welcome everyone. Why don't we give each other a hand? Welcome everyone. All right, so Name Changes Youth. There is an announcement coming up next week in regards to Name Changes Youth. So big changes are about to happen. So stay tuned for that. (laughs) Young adults. (laughs) No, no. <laughs> Young adults move. So C3 Move presents Feds and Felons. Have you guys ever been to Feds and Felons before? It says 21st on here. I've got the right date. Ignore the date on the screen. So Feds and Felons, you are on the 21st of May. So don't, not the 29th, 21st of May at 3 p.m. sharp. And you're going to be meeting at the South Perth foreshore and you're going to have a barbecue dinner afterwards at 5pm. Now let me tell you, Feds and Felons is a good time. It is a lot of fun. So if you've not been before, if you want to know more, make sure you see Elton here. He's going to be running that. Make sure you get along to that. It's for ages 17 plus. So make sure you talk to Elton if you wonder if you're old enough or too old. Go talk to Elton. (laughs) Houses of Hope. So Houses of Hope, don't forget our Connect groups, Houses of Hope will be starting up very soon, but there's still time. If you want to get into a Connect group, make sure um, you see Pastor Lisa here in the front or one of the other leaders if you want to get part of that. And the Houses of Hope launch lunch, that's the 29th. I feel like that's maybe where the confusion was. So that is on the 29th of May. There's going to be a lunch. It's going to be a potluck. So everyone will bring a prepared meal, finger food, dessert, fruit, drink, and so on. And we're going to have a sheet up the back today. Will there be a sheet up the back today to register for that? Will there be a sheet up the back today to say for next? Oh, no, no, sorry for bringing food. Next week. From next week, you will put your name down to bring food. Or if you already know... (laughs) If you already know what you want to bring, just message Lisa. I'm sure she'll remember. (laughs) Or just tell her on Sunday. She loves that. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Love Langford is back to dine in. I know. That's an exciting, that is an exciting announcement. I don't remember the last time we were in this church having dinner together with Love Lankford. We've been doing takeaways lately because of everything that's been going on in the world. But because restrictions have eased again, we are back to dine in. So if you want to volunteer, if you want to be a part of that, make sure you come and see Lisa. All right, look to the screens. We have a quick video. When I move out one day, I'll My mom will be very sad. I feel my mom's love in my heart, like, right here. I, I'm feeling it right now. Sometimes I love, sometimes I don't. But when I'm angry, I don't. 
My mom is everything to me. She just is this ray of energy and sunlight and positivity. The thing that I wish I could have done more of is thanking her. Didn't matter what shape I was in, I could always come home to mom. My mom was basically the glue that held me together. When I left the Philippines, I knew that my son will be in good hands because I know my mom will take care of him. My mom is kind of smart, you know? Dad's smart. If I would say like one to 10, it would be a five. Maybe my poor dad got the raw end of the deal, but I do remember my mother saying to him when there was an argument about something I'd done, she says, you don't want to hurt her spirit. I remember that. My mom was diagnosed with uh, a really rare disease about 12 hours before she died. So we didn't get a lot of time to, to talk or to say goodbye, but she did get to say that she loved me, which were her last words. Uh, and I cherish that. Because it, I have, I've been able to hang on to it. I'm probably gonna say to my mom, you're a wonderful person. And you're my mentor. I tie a invisible string to my heart and she ties the same one to her heart and it's always attached together. My mother, she struggled a lot with addiction. Sorry, I'm getting upset. <laughs> yeah, it was hard. You know, you have partners, you have friends, you have kids, um, but there is nobody else who, um, who will ever care about you as much. My son now always tells me, I love you, Mama. But for 48 years, you realize I didn't say I love you to my mom. I can think of three words. I forgive you. You were a good mom. You did really good. Thank you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Hey, Chelsea, if moms got paid, how much do you think they should get paid in a year for being a mom? Maybe a hundred dollars. Why are you going to do that to me, Lisa? I, <laughs> I think that the message of that is that we're not perfect as mothers. Mothers are not perfect, we don't have perfect mothers. And I think sometimes, as a mother, we can feel really guilty about the things that we do, the things that we don't do, the things that we think we should have done better. And watching our children struggle as well is a struggle for mothers. But today's just about taking care of you guys and saying that we see you and that you, you're doing a good job. It doesn't matter if you've made mistakes, because we all have, we've all felt that but you're doing a good job. Lisa, Anita, Sarah, every mother in here, you're doing a good job. Even if you feel that guilt sometimes, even if you feel like you're not perfect, you're doing a good job. And part of why we did, so on your tables there's some wildflowers, is because wildflowers, some see them as weeds, some, you know, a lot, they don't get planted, they just grow up and they're, they're beautiful. And I've got this thing that says, this is about wildflowers, it is easier to tell a person what life is not rather than to tell them what it is. A child understands weeds that grow from lack of attention in a garden. However, it is hard to explain the wildflowers that one gardener calls weeds and another considers beautiful ground cover. Here's the thing about wildflowers. They take root wherever they are, grow strong through the wind, rain, pain, sunshine, blue skies and starless nights. They dance even when it seems there is nothing worth dancing for. They bloom with or without you. And so that's what I really just wanted to say, that you mothers, you are wildflowers. Some may see you as weeds, but you're not. You are beautiful and you bloom and you are strong. <laughs> this was supposed to be a serious moment, Lisa. 
Like we may feel, sorry, more like we may feel like weeds ourselves sometimes. <laughs> but they're beautiful and they're strong and they can take anything and they can weather every storm and that's what mothers are. So I don't know if you've noticed, but Pastor Leah is not here. So poor old Pastor Leah has COVID. So their family has COVID again. Last time only Taylor ended up getting it, but um, then Leah's got it now and Charlotte's got it. Pastor Clinton at the moment has not got it, but obviously um, he's a close contact and he doesn't want to affect you guys. And also it's Mother's Day, so he'd, he'd like to be home with his wife and the mother of their family. So we still want to honour Pastor Leah as the mother of this church. She's already got a gift from us, so it's like we're giving her a virtual gift, but she actually already has the gift. Um, But I just wanted to say, so this is a story that will relate to Leah, so just bear with me. So I have struggled with masks coming off because I've started a new semester at uni and I've never seen some of these people's faces before. So I've been at uni with them for eight weeks now and not seen their face. And I've been sitting with this one girl every single week and we've been chatting and like different things because we've got a bit in common. But she must have not once taken her mask off even to have a sip of water because I had created this whole image in my brain about what she looked like. And then I walk into uni when masks have come off and I almost didn't sit with her. Because I was like, that is not the face that I thought was under that mask. I just thought I had seen her face at one point, you know, when you have a drink of water. But nope, because I had created a completely different face. And I sat down, it was her voice, so she has a very distinct voice. So she started speaking to me. And I'm just trying to keep a straight face, like, whoa, you look so different to what I had imagined. And I think sometimes we can see people only a little bit of their face and we don't get to see the full picture and so we can see Jeremy married this beautiful girl and we can see Taylor up here worshipping and we can see Taylor doing well and going to her school ball and we can see this amazing woman sorry sorry, Charlotte (laughs) going to her school ball and getting her license oh my goodness and we've seen her grow up these beautiful children and we think you've got this all together and it's easy and life is just great for you but we don't see the the effort that mothers put in we don't see the effort that Leah has put into these children to get them to that point and the sleepless nights when they were young and now that they're all out on their own with their licenses and the sleepless nights that I can imagine that would cause as well. We can only see, you know, the small part of the picture. So we just wanted to honour Leah today and just to say we see you, we see that it it wasn't an easy thing bringing up these amazing children and doing it while pastoring a church, while working, while doing all these things. So we just wanted to say we love you, Leah. We're sorry that you can't be here, but we hope that you are enjoying your Mother's Day at home. So why don't we all just give a hand to Pastor Leah and just acknowledge that we might only see a small part of the picture, but there's so much more that goes on in people's lives. So I'm now going to hand over to Elton. <laughs> Come on up, Elton. All right. Yeah, happy Mother's Day again. So what we're going to do now, we're going to... So all the kids who have made their mothers a little mug, if you can go grab your little mug and or a little teacup or coffee cup, whatever it is, and bring it up to the stage, so... All the little kids who have made themselves, their mother, a little mug. Go grab your mug, your little cup. Do they know which one's theirs? Any other kids who have made a little mug? Bring it up to the stage. Ah, awesome. Here they come. Don't you, didn't you just love that video at the end bit? It said, every story starts with a mum. Isn't that amazing? Just little things like that, that uh, mothers gave birth to us. And they, oh, is it, have we only got two? Any other kids? Oh, three. Any other kids? Maybe the other kids can just grab a mug. Just grab a mug. Any a mug? Yeah. Anyone? Take someone's mug. It's okay. Come to the center here. 
That's all right. As long as it's got no other kid's name on it. So any other kids, if you guys want to grab a mug, that's okay. Yeah? Yeah, grab a mug. Hey? All the manager kids, yeah, grab a mug and come up here. Come up, come up to the stage. Where's your mug? Sharing, sharing mugs. Look at that. I love the sharing. Every story starts with a mum. All right. Do you don't have a mug? Sure. Awesome. Excellent. Any other kids? We've got a couple more coming. Oh. <laughs> yeah, come on. Any other kids? Jordan, you're not a kid yet? Yes, come up to the stage. Any others? I think that's it. Awesome. Let's give these guys a round of applause. How cool are these? They made them all themselves. So what we're going to do now is your mum's not going to come up to the stage. No, 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 no. I'm doing something a little different. What we're going to do is you guys are going to go to your mum's. I'm always turning things around. So you guys are going to go to your mums and present them with this beautiful mug. Tell them you love them and uh, give them a big kiss, okay? So you guys can do that right now. <laughs> and while that's happening, slowly we're going to invite all the mums up to the stage. All the mums, keep on coming. Yep, all the mums. It's Mother's Day, remember? Come on, mums. Come up to the stage. Keep them coming, mums. Yeah, let's give the mums a round of applause. Yes, come on down. If you are a mum, come on down. Just down the bottom here. Yep. All the mums, yeah, keep them coming, mums. Every story starts with a mum. Yeah, that's right. Keep coming. Keep coming. Fantastic. Keep them coming and lining up at the end here. Come on, mums. Yes, come on, mum. One more mum to go. How awesome is this? Should, should we get everybody closer because of the camera? Yeah, got, um, mother's just squeezing because we're on, we're on TV right now. We're on TV. We're always on TV. Just come to the front. Or oh, actually, come to the back. Come to the top, the top, yeah. I'm always changing things around. Come, come to the top, if you can squeeze in. Some of your mums, come to the top. You're actually not in the camera. Be, no. come. come to the camera. Come to the top. Yes, come to the top so, that, so the world can see these amazing mums. Come to the top. I'm going to disappear. Yes, fantastic. Mums, go to the top. Awesome, squeeze right in, squeeze right in. Yeah, we got Ari's the cutoff. That's it. Awesome. All right, we're just going to hand these out. Anyone else want to hand these out? Maybe to the back row. How good are these mums? Carissa, to the top. To the top. We got photos going. This is amazing. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, mothers out there. Awesome. This is looking amazing. Ah, oh, all the earthly colors. Fantastic. Awesome. Almost there. Maybe a couple of times. Who has not got a little present? Fantastic. We had a couple of photos. Then I'm going to invite Pastor Paul. We're going to pray for all these beautiful mothers. Let's take a couple of photos first. We hand you to Pastor Paul. Here's a photo opportunity. Mom. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, no, 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 no. Before you go, before you sit down, before you sit down, please stand up again. Stand up again. Sorry, we're not quite there. We're almost there. I know you're almost, and it was so close too. Awesome. So, um, 
a little while ago, my, uh, my, we had a birthday celebrated my mother's birthday, and I was asked to say a few words, and um, I got a chance to say a few things. Did you know that my mother taught me logic? She said, because I said so, that's why. <laughs> my mother taught me some more logic. She said, if you fall out of that swing and break your neck, you're not going to the shops with me. <laughs> my mother taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. Well, boys, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. <laughs> my mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> my mother taught me to meet a challenge. What were you thinking? Answer me when I talk to you. Don't talk back. My mother taught me about religion. You better pray that stain comes out of the carpet. My mother taught me about hypocrisy. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. My mother uh, taught me about the science of osmosis. Um, shut your mouth and eat your dinner. Uh, my mother taught me about irony. Keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. Yeah. <laughs> my mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until your father gets home. <laughs> My mother told me about stamina. You'll sit there and eat all of that food until it's finished. My mother taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. <laughs> My mother taught me all about genetics. You're just like your father. My mother taught me all about the wisdom of age. When you get to be my age, you'll understand. And then finally, my mother taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids and I hope they turn out just like you, and then you'll see what it's like. But, but really, thank you, mums. I just want to pray a blessing over you. Um, I know that mums are amazing people. They do amazing things. So let's just pray. And what I want to do, if you can just, I'm going to lay my hands on Sianni. And if you could just lay your hand on the, here, yeah, let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for mothers. We thank you for the amazing people that they are. We thank you that um, you have blessed them with such creativity, um, the gift of life, the gift of love, that they love children unconditionally. We thank you for the stamina that you give them to be able to keep going and going and going when everything else wants to give up. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon mothers. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that they would know your peace, that they would know your rest. Lord, that I know that they worry a lot about their children. And I pray, Lord, that you would calm their fears. Lord, that you would be with them, that you would give them the wisdom to uh, be able to speak your words of life into the family, into their husbands, into their children, into their grandchildren. Lord, I pray that you would bless them abundantly and that they would know your love that they would know your rest. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you, mothers. Please take a seat. All right. Can I keep Rosemary up here, please? Rosemary? Rosemary, <laughs> we have a very happy Mother's Day, everybody. Happy Mother's Day, Pastor Leah, if she's watching. Um, she is, so happy Mother's Day. <laughs> happy Mother's Day to everyone here. We have a very special lady we are interviewing this morning. Rosemary, let's give her a clap. So Pastor Clinton was going to be doing this interview, but I am very privileged to be doing this interview. Rosemary, I've known Rosemary for some time. Rosemary will talk about her journey, how long she's been in the church and stuff like this. But what I know about Rosemary, just a few things. We had a um, connect group, a women's connect group that would meet, was I think for about a year or something, we were meeting in that room prior to COVID. And Rosemary lives, has lived and lives such a rich life. And sometimes there's just people in the background that Rosemary is an intercessor. Rosemary is always praying for us. And sometimes we can miss people like that. But if you hear her story, you will actually see what a rich life Rosemary has lived and is living and her faithfulness. You can't, you know, 
as people, we are called to represent Jesus in our life, right? And I can tell you one thing that I know about Rosemary. She's a prayer warrior. You also can't outgive Rosemary. Like literally can't outgive her. She will talk about how long she's been married for, but she just recently had a, a wedding anniversary when we, we like, mum had come and goes, Rosemary's anniversary, love Langford, let's get her some flowers, blah, blah, blah. So we do this for her. Then next week, she comes in with, like, an abundance of chocolates, right? <laughs> she, like, outgives us all the time. Any birthday, any anniversary, if you're sick or anything like that, Rosemary will remember, and she will come in with a gift every single time. And so you can't outgive Rosemary. You know, we can't outgive God, right? We can't. We can go, but the faithfulness that Rosemary has given throughout her life, and God is just in turn, just over and abundant faithful in her life. So really want to hear her story this morning. Thank you, Rosemary, for who you are to so many people in this church all the time. She's always got our back. She's always praying for us. You can always go, Rosemary, can you just pray for this? Can you just pray for that? Can you? Rosemary is always there. So thank you, Rosemary. All right, I'm going to interview you. We have a microphone here for you. This is, do you like the setup? It's very cozy. It's taking care of you. No, it's not the Lisa show. <laughs> it's not the Lisa show. But, all right, so I have a few questions for you, Rosemary. So this is Rosemary, everybody. Yeah. Rosemary, how long have you been in this church? About 28 years. 28 more. years. Yeah. So a long, long time. So faithful. Mm. Tell us a bit about you, Rosemary. So your childhood, your family, where you grew up, where you were born. A bit about you from the beginning. Okay. Um, I wasn't actually born in Australia. I was born in England in a city in Somerset called Bath. And we lived there for a number of years. And this was after the war. Um, I wasn't born during the World War II. I was born a couple of years after it. And England was still getting over the war. Both my parents had been injured in World War II, but they survived. Sadly, my mother was expecting a child at the time and the bomb blast um, caused her to miscarry and she lost her baby. But she was a real strong person. She um, would always say, you, you mustn't be a defeatist. If you say, oh, I can't do this, I don't want to do this, she would say, no, you, you mustn't be a defeatist. And um, I remember growing up and saying to her, weren't you afraid of being killed during the war? And she said, no. She said, I was too busy trying to keep alive and stay alive that I didn't even think about whether I'd be killed or not. So she was a very strong, a very strong wow. lady. And um, we lived in Bath for a while and then we moved down to Cornwall and I grew up in a little seaside village there. It was called Perrinport. It was on the north coast of Cornwall. It was a beautiful place to spend childhood. Um, from where I was living with my two brothers, we could run down the hill and we'd be at the beach or we could climb over the back wall of the house and we could run through the fields. I used to spend time picking wild flowers and bringing them home. I used to build birds' nests but none, surprisingly, we never ever got any birds to go and live in them, so that was that. Um, I used to go to a little church. It was an Anglican church. It was a beautiful little church. It was made of this Cornish stone, Cornish granite, and in the sunshine, and yes, we did get sunshine sometimes, and it would sparkle. It was beautiful. And I used to go to Sunday school, and I remember at one Sunday school lesson, a teacher said, um, she was talking to us about prayer, and she said, when you go home tonight, she said, ask your parents to pray with you. And Dad was a fairly do-it-yourself sort of person. Um, <laughs> he, 
he wasn't sort of that much of connected to praying as my mother was. So I came home and I asked mum, would she pray with me? So that night she knelt with me by my bed, the both of us both knelt together by my bed and we were praying. And I think that time just, um, it planted a seed of prayer in my life to pray. Um, eventually we left Cornwall. My father wanted to leave Cornwall. He was, he'd been in the Navy and he'd been used to warmer weather and he was a physiotherapist and he applied for a job in South Australia and he was um, accepted and we left England and we came out as 10 pound poms. <laughs> And we came out by ship. I was 10 years old, and it was a beautiful journey. We left um, London. It was Tilbury Docks. We came down the coast past um, France through the Mediterranean. We had to go past Gibraltar through the Mediterranean. Um, no one was allowed to get off the ship as we went through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea because we were migrants and it was only paid passengers that were allowed to get off. There had been, as there usually is in the Middle East, there'd been disturbances and as we're going through the Suez Canal, you could see the wrecks of ships there and it was quite interesting. And we also um, went through the Red Sea, which I thought, wow, that was great. <laughs> and. Then we came across the Indian Ocean, went to Colombo, which is Sri Lanka, and then across to Fremantle, and then, because we're going to South Australia, we went to Adelaide. And Dad was in charge. We went to Victor Harbour, which was nice. It wasn't so much of a shock going to another seaside place, because we just left one seaside place. And we used to live in this... Um, when I call it a rehabilitation centre, it wasn't for drugs or addiction or anything like that. It was for people who were recuperating from um, polio and strokes and car accidents and diseases. And Dad was in charge of the physiotherapy department. And we were living in this community, which was lovely, there was also a school there to um, teach people how to write again because a lot of people had lost the use of limbs, um, not being able to write properly and type. There was a metal workshop there so um, the men could get their skills back again. There was a carpentry shop as well, a gardening place. There was a little school there and there was a place there where people could actually learn shorthand in typing. So it really was a rehabilitation in all ways. And it was lovely that we were part of the community and the staff there. There was one other family there called the Adams family. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to take me to church. And I used to go to the Anglican church in um, Victor Harbour. And I remember one Easter, um, Dad used as a uh, hobby, he used to like to do carpentry. And I'd been going to the Anglican church and we'd been having lessons about Easter. And for some reason, Dad got into um, chooks, to chickens, I have to say, building this hen place for um, chickens. And I was watching him building, and as he was building, there was one upright with a cross he put on. And I just sat there looking at this cross, and it was the realisation came to me, even though I think I was about 11 then, of the price that Jesus paid wow. for me. Wow. And it was quite, quite a remarkable time to sort of, that like a door was opening to me. Mm. However, um, the rehabilitation centre was going to be closed and they were going to move to Adelaide and Dad didn't, and Mum didn't 
<coughs> excuse me, want to go to Adelaide. So we went to, um, we came to Perth, because Dad was going to be in charge of a rehabilitation centre in Melville. Now all these things have gone now because that was about oh, over 50 odd years ago they decided they were going to um, close that and physiotherapy would be done in hospitals. But this big change again, we did come across the Nullarbor in the train and that was fascinating because coming across the Nullarbor and just to see just how vast and huge Australia was, just going through and just there was miles and miles of just scrub, not even trees and the birds were nesting in the telephone poles that were going across. But this second big move, um, it sort of got to me a bit. I started to feel a bit insecure, I suppose, that I, what's the point of making friends if you just have to up roots and away you go again. Um, I wanted to go to church, but no one else seemed to want to go to church. So I slowly faded away. I didn't go, wasn't going to church at all. Um, progressing a bit, I left school in fourth year high school and my father told me about this um, course you could do to be what was called a registered dental nurse. And he knew someone whose sister was the matron of the dental hospital and she had told him all about this course you could do. It's now called a dinosaur course, which suits the image, because it, it just, no, it doesn't exist anymore. But it was a three year course and we had to learn all aspects of dentistry. And there was also at the hospital, which is now closed, the old dental hospital is closed, it's now part of all Perth. And we were doing, learning all aspects of every aspect of dentistry so we knew how to work with all these different specialists and different people. And we had our own little, um, it was like part of it was our own little hospital. So we worked with the registered nurses and we learned um, how to look after patients before an operation. And this is all dental operations. Wow. Um, uh, with wisdom teeth and cysts and gross and <laughs> all, all sorts of <laughs> things like that. Was, and Lots I'm not a bloodthirsty person, but I really found that all more interesting than just looking in someone's mouth and wow. having feelings, <laughs> you know. So that was that. I finished that course, did that course, and because we were following the general nurses, once you finished, you could become a staff nurse. And I had a department given to me to run. And I always wanted to travel. Um, even when we lived in Cornwall, we were lucky enough to have a car and we used to travel around all these little fishing villages looking at them. The only problems there was I used to get horribly car sick and I'd end up walking behind the car for most of the time because I couldn't take these car rides. But after doing this job, for being a staff nurse for two years, I found I'd stayed, uh, saved up enough money to go travelling. And I'd always wanted to go back to England um, just to travel, see what I hadn't seen before. So I went by ship from Fremantle and I went on my own because everyone else seemed to be messing around. They didn't want to leave this boyfriend or that boyfriend. And I thought, <laughs> I'll just leave this one and go. <laughs> so it was a wonderful trip. We went, left Fremantle, we went to Sydney. I got off that ship, I got on another ship. And we went from Sydney to New Zealand and across to Fiji and the, a lovely New Zealand family got on the ship 
who shared this cabin with me, a lovely Scottish lady and her daughter, Heather. And Heather and I become great friends, became great friends, and we decided we had all the plans in place together that we wanted to do, things we wanted to play with, um, travel to, rather. And as we were travelling across the Pacific Ocean, the ship put on this... Um, it's called the Tropical Evening Night, and you're supposed to dress up in a grass skirt and all that stuff. And I didn't have a grass skirt, and I wouldn't have worn it in any case. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wore this brightly coloured dress. And Heather had got friendly, or actually it was one of my husband's friends, had got friendly with Heather and invited her to a party. And Heather's mother said, no, you're not going to that party. And um, she said, you take Rosemary with her. And in the middle of, I think it was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean was the location of the ship. So I went to the party and long story short, it was there I met my future husband. Oh. Who was... <laughs> who was working on the ship in the electrical engineering name? department. That was Gop. Well, his real name's Godfrey, but it's a horrible name, so we just called him <laughs> Gop. And um, we went on <laughs> from the middle of the Pacific Ocean across to America. We went to Los Angeles. I went to, um, what's it called? Disneyland, which was wonderful with a crowd of girls, we all went to Disneyland and we got back on the ship, we went down the coast to Acapulco, which was becoming quite a place to go to apparently, because Elvis Presley had just made this film called Fun in Acapulco. Now you've got to realise that most of you weren't born when Elvis Presley was doing this bit. <laughs> and you'd go there and go on this trip and you'd watch this um, diving from this big rock that they had boys would get on this cliff and they would dive down into this shallow, like a bay in the harbour. So that was that and I thought, well, we've done that and we just walked around Acapulco, which was nice, but it was, after all, it was just a beach with palm trees. So we went on, <laughs> we went on down the coast and we went through the Panama Canal which was really interesting. Um, we had people explaining to us um, what the Panama Canal was all about. And we got through and we got to Cristobal, it was. And it was, we got there at night and they put a message out over the ship that it was advisable not to go um, ashore by yourself. If you were going ashore, you, you went with someone. So Heather and I went um, ashore with um, her friend then Carl and my husband eventually <laughs> got and it was very dark and creepy and we couldn't wait to get back on the ship and someone from the ship had been robbed um, going ashore there. But then we got to the West Indies, that was beautiful. We went to Bermuda, um, I went to, well, there was a, S, um, a party going out from the ship. It was like a, a trip you could go on and we went to this lovely island. It was one of the islands there in um, the West Indies and had a, a barbecue on the beach and then came back to the ship. And the ship then carried on to Miami. So we had a tour around my, Miami and eventually went across the Atlantic, which was quite rough, but it was great. I was proud to say that me and a farmer we met on the ship, we were the only two out on deck. Everyone else was being quite ill down below. It was just fascinating to watch, stand and watch the bow of the ship was just going up and down. It was just great. So we went across to France, to Cherbourg, and then eventually to... Um, uh, Southampton. So the first three months I was there in England, I stayed with people who were actually my godparents in 
Wiltshire, and I got a job at a sausage factory, but I was working in the office taking orders, so that was all right. And then <coughs> eventually I went up to London and I worked for, it was a nursing agency run by an Australian lady, and it was called the Southern Cross Nursing Agency, but she was hiring out um, general nurses, mental nurses and dental nurses. And I got a job, first job of all was to work in Belgravia, and that's quite a posh area of London, but they still let me in, so it was all right. <laughs> and a list for the day, it was, it read something like a royal garden party. It was lady this and sir this and, you know, rear admiral, somebody or other. But the patients were absolutely mm. beautiful people. They really were interested in what I was doing and I really loved that job. But because we were temporary people, I then moved on to another clinic and, and worked in Harley Street in London, which is another famous medical street, and then moved on to another clinic and worked in King's Cross in London. Um, eventually, Heather and I got together, we got our plans right, and we hitchhiked around England and um, Nobody Wales take that advice, Scotland. don't hitchhike. <laughs> 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 I think people mainly took pity on us to give us a lift, but that was great, and from there we had this tour planned. It, I don't know if you've heard of Contiki Tours, but this was a tour continuous to um, Contiki Tours, and it was actually a camping tour that we went right round Europe. We started off in um, London and we went across to uh, Holland, and from Holland we went across to Germany, and we went wow. from West Germany into East Germany to West Germany, and this was the time of the Berlin Wall. And to get um, out of East, uh, West Germany into East Germany, you had to have a special visa. There were guards that came, because um, we were traveling in this van, we all had to get out. You took all your luggage out. They measured the seats of the van. They had these big mirrors on um, wheels that went under the van to make sure we weren't carrying any you know, people or whatsoever underneath this van. And we went into East Berlin, and that was when the wall was still there. And it, going from West Berlin into East Berlin was like going into two different time zones. And I'd never ever seen people wandering around with guns and rifles, but in East Berlin, we were watched the whole time, and I must have I couldn't wait to get out. So we travelled through um, a couple of other communist countries, and we had visas, and they would write, as soon as you entered their country, they would write on your visa the, the um, time and date that you got there, and when you got out, they would check the time and date, wow. because they were worried about who was, you know, um, doing the wrong thing by being in these communist countries. We eventually got down to Turkey. Um, we went to Istanbul, around from there we left. We went across to Greece and then all to Italy and then across the Mediterranean coast. And um, we went to Spain and then back to England and then I came, came, uh, made plans to come wow. home again. You've so lived a very rich travelling life, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so caught another ship home, um, down, back down the coast of Africa to, to come home. And it was there actually, I was staying actually before I left with my future husband's um, family and he was on the holidays from his ship and when he um, when I was saying well, I've got to go a couple of days before I got on the ship to go he'd received his 
um, sailing orders, and lo and behold, he was um, sent to the same ship I was going back home was. <laughs> so we eventually got engaged in Kings Park. Um, Mum and Dad had never met him before, and I just said, um, this is Gough, we've just got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'd only, we had a picnic up there with the family and we'd only been engaged, I suppose, <laughs> together for about four hours and we had to get back to the ship <laughs> to sail away. I eventually went back to England and we got married in England and I was married there and... Two years later, we came back to Perth to live. And three years after that, our first um, child was born, who was a girl, Louise. And eight or 15 months later, my son was born, who is Ian. So that was great. And it was the time um, I hadn't gone back to... I loved going around churches in Europe. And I just love sort of looking at all the beautiful glass stained windows and everything. But I just, just felt I wasn't going, going to go back to church. I just felt this insecurity that you made a connection and so what, you moved on somewhere else as a child. But when the children were born, um, I started thinking, oh, this, I should get them christened and my husband, because we're at the, belong to the Anglican Church. And my husband was saying, you should, yes, we should do that. And I just felt, yes, I've, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And I remember I used to buy um, little books. It was the little golden book series for children. And there was all these Bible stories for children and I would sit at night and we would read these. They would be in bed and I'd come and sit in bed with them and we would read Bible stories. And Ian loved, um, he loved Noah's Ark and he loved um, the story of the whale, you know, and being swallowed by a whale. He reckoned, whale, he reckons that was cool. <laughs> Louise loved the nativity and things about flowers and things. And eventually I did go back to the Anglican church in, in Limwood. And I went to confirmation classes there, which is what you do in the Anglican church. And eventually um, the minister who was there left. And we had a new minister who came who was born again, full of the Holy Spirit, and things changed for the better. <laughs> and we used to, Martin, who is now a friend of mine, he used to take some of us to the Wimber conferences. Um, some of you might have heard of John Wimber. He used to come to Perth um, for different conferences, and I thought it was great. The music was different. It was a whole new whole new atmosphere there and there was times for prayer and that's when I went up for prayer and I decided I would rededicate my life Amen. to the Lord <laughs> and it was wonderful. The Holy Spirit was moving so tremendously there. People would just pray for you and bang, you'd be down on the floor which was great. And at one of these Wimber conferences I went to, um, there was a call for the young teenagers to go down. And I just went down as well because I felt the Lord was saying, go down there, go, go down with these teenagers. And what resulted as a, um, from that was my two children were going to um, Linwood High School and I kept thinking a prayer group that was coming to me all the time. 
So I made an appointment to see the school chaplain and spoke to him and about having a prayer group there for, you know, the parents of, you know, and anyone who would go. So we did. We did um, have a prayer group there going, which was really good. Um, Neil's not here today, but Neil was part of the prayer group as well. And while I was at the prayer group, Martin Wynne gave me um, this information. It was called Prayer Groups for Schools. He said to me, you'd be interested in this. And so I got connected with Prayer Groups for School. And that was encouraging parents and people to pray um, for school children and school children, of course. And we used to hold... um, prayer days for children. We had one here, um, another one at another um, college in Perth, and another one at another uh, primary school somewhere. And this was good to um, have these prayer days for children. And at this this time, it was was really great to uh, have these days and you know, be connecting to different people around the state because we had a prayer chain operating as well and we would send our information. And we also got connected with um, Prayer Groups Australia, which was good too, so we could hand on on the information there. Um, So how long have you been married for? To the same person for 50 years. (laughs) 50 years. So she's been married for fi- married for fifty years. Fifty years. Yep. And you've yes. been here in this church for thirty for years. Twenty to twenty-eight, 28 years, years, almost thirty years. Yeah. Right? And you've yeah. gone through a few um, health issues in your life and stayed. Just I, explain just a few things that you've actually gone through and just I guess what made you stay faithful in Jesus while you went through a few of your health through what we were going yeah. through. Um, right, about 11 years ago it was now, the family did go through um, not such a nice time. It started off, we'd been down at holidays at Mandra and our granddaughter, who was probably about five at the time, had an accident and she badly broke her arm. The humerus here... Um, I won't say too much about it because I was telling someone once about this and they nearly fainted. She badly broke the humerus, which is the long bone from your Mm. shoulder down to your elbow. So it wasn't, it was broken just above the elbow joint. So it just wasn't, the arm wasn't connected. We took her to the hospital at um, Peel, Peel Hospital. They had a look at her, they took an x-ray and they said this is far too, far too complex for us to um, manage. So she was taken by ambulance to Princess Margaret Hospital as it was yeah. then. And I remember I cried all the way up. <laughs> I wasn't in the ambulance, we were following by car. Prayed all the way up and when we got there, um, she was examined and an orthopaedic registrar came and he was talking about um, putting plates and screws in her arm and it was, she was only just tiny. <laughs> I thought, no, this, this is awful. So she was taken into surgery and they had taken more x-rays and they had initially given her drugs to and take her through what was going to be like a three or four hour operation. But she, um, while she was under the sedation, they'd taken another x-ray and they'd found that perhaps this breakage wasn't severe as they'd first um, noted. So instead of having plates and um, screws put in her arm, it was bound up and she was immobilised for six weeks. And when the um, 
bandages and everything was taken off. Her arm wasn't straight and it was said maybe she would never have a straight arm again. And my daughter was crying and my husband said he felt sick. <laughs> and I just went out into the garden to my favourite spot and I just... <laughs> I know it says you can approach the throne of grace, you know, boldly. And I think it was the most bold I've ever been in my life. And I just said, no, Lord, we, we can't have this. This is not on. We're not going to have a little girl with a bent arm. This is not on. I'm not having it. No, I'm not having it. And I'd like to say I went in all miracle, the arm was straight. But what happened was... We worked with her, we had various exercises to do and every time we, we were doing exercises I'd pray and pray and I'm really thrilled to say her arm is normal. Amen. <laughs> she plays a lot of um, uh, sport and then if that wasn't enough, my son came home from university really, really ill and... We had to get an ambulance to him to take him to Fremantle Hospital and he was put in isolation there. Nobody knew what was wrong with him and they just said it's a virus. But it was quite a severe virus and he was just kept overnight, put on a drip and he recovered very quickly because um, oh, we were just up all night praying for mm. He would be okay. So he recovered that and my husband retired and two weeks after he retired, he was diagnosed with cancer. So that meant he had to have treatment and eventually he had to have an operation. And I became, started becoming really tired and I thought, well, heck, it's three great things we've been through. I just just felt really washed out, tired. And eventually I ended up at Fremantle Emergency having a blood transfusion. And the next day I had another transfusion and I had iron, I had a blood transfusion in one arm and an iron transfusion in the other arm. And eventually I saw a, um, a specialist and he recommended more tests. I was diagnosed with cancer on a Tuesday afternoon and operated on an early Friday morning. And during this time, I had been going to um, a Saturday afternoon Bible class and it was over at, just across the road here, actually called Open Hand. And one afternoon during that time, a quiet time, I felt the Lord was saying to me, whatever you're going through, I'm going to make a way through Amen. this for you. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. And then on the way to the hospital, it was sort of, we had to leave home at five in the morning and it was cloud because it was summertime. And there was this bank of cloud all over Perth but as we turned down to go down Row Highway to go to the hospital, I looked up and there was an opening in the, in the clouds, like a pathway mm. through the clouds. And I wish to this day I had taken a photo of that. And it was God's reassurance to me that whatever I was going through, whatever was coming up, he was making a way through Amen. and he was going to be with me. Amen. So I survived that <laughs> and 18 months later I was diagnosed with a different sort of cancer. So the same thing I thought, right, you said to me whatever I was going through mm. you would make a way through and you would be with me. Mm. So... I survived that as well. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So um, I'm, still, I'm still here. You're still here? Um, yeah. And tell us, what, what's something that you... Is that the promise? The promise that God's always going to get you through? Like what advice do you give yourself right now and advice that you can actually give all of us 
Because every person here, different age, different stage, yes. what would you actually speak to them all and say what you tell yourself or what you would have told your younger self to what you tell every single person here today? To God. Well, we're never alone. The Lord is, is always with us. He never leaves us. He never say, forsakes us. Um, he is there, there with us the whole yeah, time. Amen. And the thing is quiet times with the Lord, prayer times with the Lord. We hear a lot um, about go-to places. Go-to, it seems to be a phrase that's becoming popular. Well, I, this is my go-to. <laughs> I like my quiet times. I like reading. I've got favorite verses. I read, and that's, that's my yeah, go-to. Amen. What yeah. an amazing life, yeah. faith-filled life. Yes. We want to thank you, Rosemary, because it's, it's such, I keep saying it's such a rich life, but to actually listen to everything Rosemary's gone through, to what she's been through, to where she is today, and how she can just encourage every single one of us to continue being in our word. We were speaking today, and we'll get the band up to actually sing this song, but we were just to close up, but we were singing today about promises and God's faithfulness. And that's exactly what he's done through Rosemary's life, is the promises, yeah. the faithfulness, and he's never let her go. He's never let your family go. Yeah. And no. what a rich life. We praise God for you, Rosemary. I reckon we pray for Rosemary. Yeah. This is for you, Rosemary. This is oh. to say thank you. So these thank flowers you. are for you. <laughs> so just all stretch your hands out to Rosemary. Thank you, Father. We just thank you, God, for such an amazing woman of you, Father. Throughout her life, from the very moment that she's kneeling with her mum, praying God to where she is standing right now, you've never let her go. Everywhere that she's been, you have surrounded her, you have covered her, you've brought her through such hard times, Father, but you have seen her through. And through the pathway of the cloud, Father, that's your promises, that you will be with her and you will make a way no matter what happens. And we pray this continues over Rosemary's life, over her family's life, Father, that you build a hedge around them, God, and you're continuously protecting her, Father. And we just thank you, Lord that as she just continuously pours out of you to every single person that's surrounding her and that's around her, God, that you just continue to pour your love out through her, God, that she can outpour onto every single person that meets her, that speaks to her, that touches her, Lord. And we just thank you for such a strong prayer warrior of you, God. May you bless her life, Father, even more than you have, God, and just continuously bless her family, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rosemary. We want to give this to you. And I just pass this down. Can I grab the band up? But I just want, if everyone just closes their eyes, I'm sitting here. Okay. So I don't know if there's everybody here that's actually made a decision in their life uh, to, to serve God, to actually go, you know what, throughout my life, do different things. We all go through different things. It might not be the same journey as Rosemary. It could be very different, but you all go through something. You all go through things. It's ups and downs, and that's what we face in life. And I just want everyone to close their eyes, and if you haven't made that decision or if you have and you've walked away, that we're just going to pray a prayer. Just put your hand on your heart if that's you, and you go, you know what, this is what I want to do. This is I want to give my heart back, or I want to give my heart to the Lord because I want someone to walk with me through every stage of my life, through everything that I'm going through or will go through. So we just want to pray this prayer. And we're going to pray this prayer all together. All right. And be loud because you're all so quiet. All right. So, dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life. And I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Saviour always. And I just say a prayer over every single person that's here today. I pray that you are blessed. 
I pray that you will get something from Rosemary's story, Rosemary's life that she's journeyed to know that you're never alone, to know that He will make a way through anything that you are facing, anything that you are going through, that you are encouraged to be in God's Word. You're encouraged to find your favourite verses. You're encouraged to find your secret place in your quiet place where you spend with your Lord Jesus. And I just thank you for every single one of you. Bless your lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing promises because that's who God is to us, yeah? Rosemary, I'll carry that for you.